god, I am doing it again, and I cannot believe it. It's been, I don't know how long since I did last Rome review clip, and I'm still on the first fucking episode, and if any living soul has been waiting for me to do this thing, I'm sorry, I apologize, but you know how it is, state exams, chores, laziness, just everyday life. If you are at all interested in hearing my fucking excuses, because I know you wouldn't be. Now, before I go on with the actual review, I want to make a small point. Weird as it may sound, I'm actually glad that it's taking me so long to make this review, because as I'm taking this long time between making these videos, I'm reading a lot, meaning lots of books on the Roman world, like fiction and non-fiction. I'm reading Robert Graves. I, I read it already, actually. Uh, I, Claudius and Claudius the God and Gibbon, and I'm surfing the web for various sources, and I'm geeking over every fucking ancient building in Rome, and I'm digging up all sorts of details on places and events, etc. My point being, I'm getting more and more informed about everything Rome-related, and thus my overall review of this particular show is going to be more sort of grounded, knowledgeable, if you will, more like of, of higher quality. Because I look at my previous videos and I just see the level of my, well, stupidity and unawareness about the sphere. Like saying, oh look, I think this is a temple of Jupiter. Like, of course it is, you idiot. To someone more experienced, this would not even be a question. It's totally obvious that it's the temple up on the hill since you're looking at the tabularium and seeing what's behind it. It's just that I was fucking stupid. And now, I dare say, I am not that stupid. For example, I know every fucking building in the forum now, Republican built or Empire built slash rebuilt. I know the hills and numerous other buildings in the city, people, laws and stuff. And I'm basically way more knowledgeable about Rome as a whole than I was these several months ago. Thus, my review of HBO's Rome, although being made slow as a fucking snail, is going to be ultimately better. So that is enough of me explaining myself to the world. Without further ado and further crap, let's finally get to finishing the review of this first episode of the first season of Rome. And the episode is called The Stolen Ego. And this is part three of my review, which starts from about, yeah, 31 minutes into the episode. And I'll try not to break this one off before it's over, because I want to finish this first episode once and for all. Okay, so at this point, we're on the road with our two protagonists, Pulo and Varinus. They're getting to know each other, getting kind of deeper into their love-hate bromance, and they're looking for the ego. And Varinus lets out a pessimistic speech about what he thinks of their mission. Uh, they're never gonna find the ego, he says. He only took Pulo with him on this failure of a mission, because Pulo is a dead man already. But if Pulo is a dead man, what would stop him from killing Varinus? Well, if Pulo has no honor, Varinus has superior fighting skills. This is just a lovely scene between these two. See these two man bitches get a little passive aggressive before becoming BFFs. It's a great relationship. And I think I kind of hit a rock when researching the real personalities of these two, because uh, there really were two men named Pulo and Varinus, and they did remain in written history, vaguely as may be, but I remember reading somewhere that almost no other info except their names was preserved and what rank they had in the army and crap. So us not being bothered by concrete historical fact, we can loosely form two awesome characters in a complex relationship that ultimately makes for great screen fiction. That's precisely what they did in HBO's Rome and I'd say they struck gold with these two. Uh, Edmir Brutus... <laughs> is the one we see afterwards having a party with the rich bastards. Uh, he talks about how he's bored by his family tradition of politics of about five centuries and how he likes the idea of the German way of justice, which is a Game of Thrones style of trial by single combat justice. Well, I'd say that's a premonition because he's gonna get what he wants eventually. Then Pompey tries to minx Brutus into giving him a report on the state in Caesar's camp. Because we know, I think, Pompey was the one who arranged for the ego to be stolen. Or was it? 
I don't remember with certainty, but then again, the first time I saw this episode, I didn't even realize he was behind it all. So I imagine my understanding of the plot is better now in any case. Then a nice awkward scene. I always love the awkward moments. Brutus slips up about Pompey being a plebeian, and then he rushes away from the shame. Then in the next scene, we see the beginning of Octavius' troubles, when, when Caesar appoints uh, Atia with the task of finding Pompey a new wife. And we know Atia is gonna try and get in on the honey. She comes up with the idea of marrying her own daughter to Pompey. Servilia comes by and in a session of boring small talk, she compliments Atia on her dress and Atia goes with the reaction, <laughs> bitch, I know I'm fabulous. She, she kind of says these exact words without even saying them for real. And that's why I love this bitch so much. The fictional version of Atia and uh, Polly Walker as an actress is simply amazing. And I will never get beyond the fact how I've hardly seen her in any other stuff. I basically remember seeing her in Clash of the Titans, the remake that is, uh, and that's it. I mean, how is that fucking possible? Or is it just me sucking at watching movies so much that I've not seen her in anything else? Uh, then Servilia asks where Octavian is. Well, Octavian is fucked. And that's why his mummy tries to make the gods save him. She makes a sacrifice and asks for providence and gets the good news that Octavian will live. Now, what was that ritual? Yes, I get the bull killing and everything, but what exactly is that cult? Who is this great mother that says no harm shall come to her boy? Is it Isis or something? I don't know, I'm not that interested in the religious details, so I wouldn't know to what extent this ritual is fictional. I mean, what's with the blood shower? And by the way, as a kid, I grew up around uh, animals being slaughtered, and I've never seen an, anim an animal bleed so fast and so, well, hard, after just one blow. I mean, wasn't the blood just too much like Gary Bucket style or something? And then it suddenly stops. Slaughtered animals bleed a lot longer than this, so I gotta say, I don't like this so much, it's a little bit of a uh, Hollywood shock touch. And I get it, but I still don't like how they did it. Could have been a little more realistic. But then again, how many people of the civilized world would even care about or would even want to see a realistic bleeding of an animal? Well, I for one would, but whatever, I'm a special case. So we see the true bitch value of Atia when she lies to poor stupid Octavia that Caesar is the one who wants her to divorce Clabius and marry Pompey. The man's been in Gaul for eight years. He's practically a wild beast. <laughs> I just love this line and right after it comes one of my favorite scenes and I have like a hundred others from all the two seasons but this has got to be the first one. Octavia leaves the household of her ex-husband and he's crying and his slaves are crying because Octavia is leaving in crap and then Atia goes in her litter. What a loser, he has tears in his eyes, and his slaves, what a fuss, I think you feed them too much. <laughs> and she talks about them as if she's talking about chickens in a barn. And if you're the kind of person that I am, you just gotta love the fuck out of this scene. I just fall every time for the weird, dark, racist, and anti-human kind of humor. I think it's hilarious, and the fact that I probably shouldn't find it hilarious makes it all the more hilarious to me. I mean, look at that face. It's as if she's saying, oh, for fuck's sake, human emotions, human feelings. Are you fucking kidding me? I cannot describe in simple words how much I love these kinds of characters. It probably tells you about how fucked up I am myself. And uh, by the way, we get this awesome glimpse, uh, a panorama of the everyday streets of ancient Rome. Just so nice. And is that on the Palatine Hill or not? I'm not sure, but I'd say it's not. Still a beautiful view. Again, one of the many reasons why I love this show so much. Then we see Octavia put on the sexy arsenic makeup and get a little courage speech from her ambitious bitch of a mom. And then we're off to the nice pre-sex dinner with Pompey, where things get as hilarious and awkward as can be. For the record, this is one of the reasons I love history so much. The obsolete fashions and values of everyday life how people get arranged into marriages, how the sexual element was not such a huge taboo. All this stuff is shown and shoved into the faces of modern people and modern understandings of life. And it's just hilarious to observe the shocked and awkward reaction of the viewer. And to even observe your own reaction, because 
I myself am not that impressed with these weird past values of antiquity, since I grew up in a country and among people that tend to be a little late when it comes to social and economic development. I mean, this shocking Roman way of thinking is not shocking to me, but my brain still makes the connection and opposition between these and modern values, and the contrast is just hilarious. Like, imagine some, I don't know, some BBC aristocrats talking about a future wedding, and one of them goes, you're not still married, but you could absolutely fuck the bride even now. <laughs> but I'm getting carried away. So, uh, Pompey boasts about his military genius, and you can see it is a matter in which Atia is totally experienced and competent. I mean, look at that face and quick reaction. She's gotta know what outflanking the flankers must mean. <laughs> And the masterly Pompey is given his offer of marriage, which he accepts just as awkwardly and randomly. They're all family now, after all. And then we get the usual HBO special, which I shall refrain from depicting. Some boobs and bat pussy. Rome did it before Game of Thrones was cool. And Pompey takes his betrothal privileges in the presence of Merula, Atia's slave, who is just such a nice-looking and heartwarming person. Can you imagine your wedding night in the presence of that? Just lovely. Ah, oh, then we get a nice fire scene with Pulo and Marinus, who are looking for the eagle, and Pulo discusses his, his taste for savage British cunning. We are introduced to Marinus's marital values. He loves and respects his, his wife. And it's kind of sweet when you see it in between all this, all these arranged marriages and awkward sex scenes and bull slaying. Uh, but then again, he's gonna drive her to suicide eventually, so yeah. Then because Pulo is a genius watch, the horses get stolen. And then conveniently and Hollywoody enough, it turns out the horses being stolen was actually a good thing. Because then they go on foot and come across Octavian and his captors. And not only that, they have the eagle. So a little plot convenience over here, but when you've experienced so many other shows and movies that were complete crap, you're just bound to not give a fuck about such minor problems in an overall amazing film. Disciplined Roman soldiers easily get rid of barbarian idiots, and so starts our first interaction between our two protagonists and the future Emperor Augustus, Gaius Octavius of the Julii. A Roman citizen of noble birth has to say please to Pullo so that Pullo release him. You shot the little bitch's mouth so good. By the way, my first impression of the Octavian actor was not good at all. I mean, I thought it was as wooden as can be because of the following exposition speech that he has. But in the course of the show, I came to admire him because his woodiness, however that may sound, turned out to be... Not the actor's woodiness, but the woodiness of a cold and calculating person, a guy who is distant from his emotions, which would fit the personality of probably the greatest emperor who walked the earth. So now wait. I'm watching this scene again for the review. Okay, did Caesar lose the eagle on purpose? Because I thought Pompey kind of arranged it so Caesar looks screwed in the eyes of his soldiers. Now it turns out Caesar's the one who arranged it so that Pompey takes it as an opportunity to attack him. This got me a little confused throughout the review because I've been doing these portions of, of the episode in between months and I tend to lose the trail and the exact details of what's going on, so sorry. Then this is where I complain about this initial wooden acting on behalf of the Octavian actor. I mean, he goes like, Caesar has won the love of the people, a battle is inevitable. I repeat, he was overall awesome as Octavian, but this scene and line just make me cringe every time I see it. It's one of the few things that I don't like in this show as a whole, and of course in the first episode specifically. So then they retrieve the lost eagle, and I ask myself, if Caesar wanted the eagle to be stolen, is he now unhappy that it's been found? And after all, bringing the eagle back to the legion is a good omen in both the people's eyes and the soldiers' eyes, so isn't that a win-win situation? Then Mance Raider is an awesome actor, I just love his reaction when he sees Octavians here. And here I go with a confusion again. The head of the man who had the eagle is one of Pompey's slaves, so was I right initially? Did Pompey really arrange the whole eagle thing and not Caesar? Apparently so. 
And because Pompey has the cunning of a sardine, I gotta love that expression, <laughs> the battle begins. Then we see how busts are made, really cool. Then Pompey realizes he is fucked, and then we get one of these favorite moments of mine. A spectacular view of the Roman Forum, and I think it's really incredible. Because everywhere else you see depictions of the Forum, it's always during the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. Because it was best built up then. But I always wanted to see an authentic view of the Forum during the time of Caesar and Augustus. And not that this is like 100% authentic, but who the fuck can say for sure whether it is or is not. It's still an amazing view and the best one yet we've seen on screen of this specific period. So we fly over what's to become the Basilica Julia, uh, if it already isn't, but I think historically he mostly built it after Pompey was defeated. I don't remember precisely. So the Basilica Julia and the gorgeous early version of the Temple of Saturn, then Concordia with the tabularium behind it, and then next to those, is that the Senate house that was there before the Curia Julia? Because if you look closely, it has the SPQR initials on its facade. Is that what the Senate house looked like? Because if you look at it, it's a rotunda and, and it looks a little weird, like the Pantheon. But I do remember seeing the old Senate house on plan. It was kind of a round structure, but I don't know, it still bugs me a little. Then in the background looms the Capitoline Hill. We see the Temple of Moneta and a little corner of Jupiter Maximus, Maximus. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. And when you think that they built all of this for real and you can still go and visit it in Rome besides the ruins of the original forum, it just makes me go crazy. And Pompey says a big fuck you to the Julian family as he marries a whole new bride. Octavia is shamed and so is Atia and we get one of my favorite scenes when Octavia gives us one of those little like mother like daughter moments. I want him dead she says. She wants the blood of Pompey and that she will have because Atia will make sure of it. We get this awesome mom and girl out for blood scene. Accompanied by the awesome creepy music from ancient sounding instruments. So good. I gotta point out, I pay enormous attention to my music whenever I watch a film. How the film for me is the music itself. I'm one of those guys that walks around town listening to dramatic soundtracks on his phone instead of, you know, regular music. And that's all the time. I really, really appreciate the music in a movie or a show or whatever. I love and watch Game of Thrones, for example. Not so much because of the acting or the writing or something. I watch it because combined with its amazing soundtrack, it gives me so much muse, so much creative energy all the fucking time. And it's the same with Rome. Even more so with Rome. Because if Game of Thrones became kind of crappy, Rome did not. So we have both the amazing actors and story plus the amazing music. And then we finally see Caesar headed back to Rome and the camp burning behind them. And oh my god, I cannot fucking believe it. I finished reviewing the first episode of Rome. I finished reviewing the Stolen Eagle. <sighs> so final words for conclusion of the episode. The first time I saw it, it hooked me pretty good. I mean, not that much, not that nerdgasmically, but it did hook me. Uh, we had a great introduction of, of all the characters, especially Atia and Caesar. We had a great opening of the great city of Rome itself, visually. And all in all, it was a total treat and a worthy beginning of this amazing show. Uh, next up is my review of episode 2 of season 1. And it's called uh, How Titus Pullo Brought Down the Republic. Hmm. <laughs> I hadn't noticed the specific title before, it's really fun to think about it, how our main kind of idiotic British cunny lover protagonist brought down the great Roman Republic. Wow.